Hello everyone, I am Deepta Vashak. I am a first year undergrad at IC Bangalore. And in this video, we are going to have a discussion on the UGP paper of the ISI entrance 2016. So let's get started. We'll start with the first question. The first question says that there is a sports tournament featuring N players and each pair plays one game. There is always a winner and a loser, and which means there can be no draws. We have to show that the players can be arranged in an order in such a way that the ith player has always beaten the player to its immediate right in the order that we write it. So this is P1. The question demands that given n players S1, S2, all the way till Sn, we can order them in this way p1 p2 all the way till pn this is just a permutation of sn this is just a permutation of s1 all the way till sn so the question demands that we show that there exists such a permutation such that pi has defeated E i plus 1 for all i equals 1 to all the way till n minus 1. So, in order to prove this, we will proceed uh, with the method of induction, the principle of mathematical induction. We will look at the at a base case first. Um, a tournament with just one player makes very little sense. So, we will look, look at a tournament with two players first. So th that will be our base case. Base case will be, suppose we have two players, S1 and S2. So there will be one match between them. So the tournament will have just one match. And say, without the loss of generality, that out of these two players, S1 wins. That is, S1 defeats S2. Then we can simply reorder them. We can simply reorder them as P1, P2, where P1 is S1 and P2 is S2. So in this ordering, P1 has defeated P2 because P1 is just S1, and we have assumed that S1 wins in that match. So we have seen that in the base case, such a reordering is possible. Now we'll, uh, we establish an induction hypothesis. So we assume that such a reordering is always possible when there are at, when there are less than or equal to n players for some natural number n. I will write that down. This is our induction hypothesis. Our induction hypothesis is that such an arrangement such an arrangement or such a permutation actually such a permutation of the players such a permutation always exists always exists for all uh, number of players suppose we have whenever we have less than equal to n players I'm sorry. Whenever we have less than equal to n players. Now we look at a tournament in which there are n plus 1 players. Now look at this tournament. We have n plus 1 players and we name them as S1, S2, S2, all the way till Sn and s n plus 1 so this is a tournament where there are n plus 1 players by our induction hypothesis the first n players 
will have a permutation because we have assumed this. This is our assumption. So they have a permutation S sigma 1, S sigma 2, all the way till S sigma n. This is the permutation of the first n players such that that condition holds that S of such that S of sigma i has defeated S of sigma i plus 1 for all i from 1 to n minus 1. So we are done with the first n players. Now we introduce the n plus 1 player. We look at this player. If this player has defeated all other n players if this player has defeated all other n players if sn plus 1 has defeated all players from s1 s2 all the way to s n then we can just place it to the left we can just place sn plus 1 here because sn plus 1 has defeated every player here sn plus 1 will then have defeated s sigma 1 and the other permutation is already a good permutation because which means that this permutation satisfies all the conditions of the question. So if that is not the case, that is, if it is not the case that S n plus 1 has defeated all n players, all other n players, then we define let L be the let L be the largest positive integer let l be the largest positive integer such that s sigma l has defeated s n plus 1 right okay i should mention this sigma 1 sigma 2 sigma 3 other than sigma n that is just a permutation of the first n natural numbers that is sigma from 1, 2 till n is a bijection. Sigma is a bijection from 1, 2 all the way till n to 1, 2 all the way till n. And this is just, uh, this is called a permutation. A permutation of this set. Okay. Okay. So, once we have this, so S sigma L has defeated S n plus 1. Now it is very clear that we can, uh, where we can place S n plus 1. If the players are S1, S2, S L, S, uh, I'm sorry, uh, these should be sigma 1, sigma 2. Sigma 1. Sigma 2, Sigma L, Sigma L plus 1, and S Sigma N. So, since L is the largest positive integer, such that S of Sigma L has defeated S N plus 1, none of the players here have defeated S N plus 1, which just means that Sn plus 1 has defeated all of these players. Sn plus 1 has defeated all of these players. And Sn plus 1 has been defeated by this player. So we can just place Sn plus 1 right here. We can place Sn plus 1 right here. So our permutation will be S sigma 1, S sigma 2, S sigma L, S n plus 1, S sigma L plus 1, and S sigma n. So, given a permutation, when there are n players, we have for created a, a possible, or a, I should say, a good permutation of n plus 1 players, when there are n plus 1 players. 
um, what I what I mean by a good permutation is that a permutation of all these players that satisfies the conditions given in the question that the ith player has defeated the i plus one th player. So as you can see that in this permutation, all of these sigma i's have defeated s sigma i has defeated s sigma i plus one for all i from one to n minus one and additionally s sigma l has defeated s n plus one and s n plus one has defeated all of these players so this permutation satisfies all of the questions all of the conditions given in the question and we are done by the principle of mathematical in induction so done by the principle of mathematical induction okay by the way uh, We should um, just for clarity we can write we are taking this as p1 p2 we are just renaming renaming them all the way till this will be pl this will be p l plus one p l plus two all the way till p um p n plus one so these are the this is the ordering that was asked in the question and we are done. So the first question is solved. Yeah. Okay, we will now look at um, the next question. We will now look at the next question. Hmm. Next question gives us a cubic polynomial to, uh, with integer coefficients and there are certain conditions given in the question. Uh, conditions on the coefficients. And we have to prove that not all roots of p of x can be rational. So in order to solve this question, you should know a theorem known as the rational roots theorem. I will mention it briefly. But it is a good exercise and you should try to prove it on your own. So I will mention it during the question, during the solution. So we are given a cubic polynomial. Um, we are given a cubic polynomial p of x, which goes as ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d, where a, b, c, d are all integers. We are given that a D is odd and B C is even. Since we are given these two question, uh, these two conditions, there are two simple observations that we can make right away. Those observations are first of all, the first observation is since A D is odd, you should notice that none of A and D, none of A and d can be even so both a and d are odd both a and d are odd and the second observation is bc is even we are given that bc is even so it is not possible that both b and c are odd if both b and c are odd bc can't be even so at least one out of b and c must be even so at least one of b and c must be even at least one of b and c must be even with that established we will look at the solution we will highlight this because we will return Back to this later. Okay. We are the question uh, asks us to prove that not all roots of p of x can be rational. We try to prove it, uh, prove this question by the method of uh, by uh, by proof by contradiction. So for that, we assume 
we assume for the sake of contradiction that all roots of p of x are rational p of x is a cubic polynomial so there can only be there can only be three roots and we assume for the sake of contradiction that all of these three roots are rational so say the roots are say the roots are p1 by q1 p2 by q2 and p3 by q3 where the general conditions apply for rational numbers pi and qi are integers qi is non zero and pi comma qi are co prime for all i equals 1 2 and 3 okay so now we will use the rational root theorem what the rational root theorem says is that if p of x is an integer polynomial and p1 by q1 is a rational root of p then the numerator p1 will divide d and q1 will divide a this is known as the known as the rational root theorem so for all this applies for all of these rational roots so in general we have that pi divides d and qi divides a for all i equals 1 2 3 and since we had established that both a and d are odd we can easily see that pi's all of the pi's and all of the qi's must be odd so all pi's and qi's so all PI, pi's and qi's are odd now we use another useful result uh, that is vietas formula which is very useful in questions involving polynomials so what that tells us is by vietas formula the sum of the roots p1 by q1 uh, i'm sorry p1 by q1 plus p2 by q2 plus p3 by q3 the sum of roots is equal to minus b by a now simplifying this gives us yeah so simplifying this gives us p1 q2 q3 plus q1 p2 q3 plus q1 q2 p3 over q1 q2 q3 is equal to minus b by a we just cross multiply and get a p1 q2 q3 plus q1 p2 p3 plus q1 q2 p3 did i write correct no i wrote something wrong here yeah this should be q this is equal to minus b times q1 q2 q3 okay we had already established that all qi's and all pi's are odd we were given in the question that a is odd so this is odd um, i'll use a highlighter so this is odd this is odd and this is odd this is odd as well so 
the left hand side is odd odd because odd plus odd is even even plus odd is odd and this is odd so left hand side is odd in the right hand side also this part is completely odd this very this immediately gives us that b must be odd so b must be odd okay now we look at another sum that is the sum of product of two roots at a time e1 by p2 um e1 by p2 by q1 q2 i'm sorry i misspoke it is p1 p2 by q1 q2 plus p1 p3 by q1 q3 plus p2 p3 by q2 q3 is equal to is equal to c by a so sim now simplifying this gives us p1 p2 q3 plus p1 q2 p3 plus q1 p2 p3 i'm just skipping a step it's the same calculation as above this is equal to c times q1 q2 q3 now by by a same argument as in the previous case we know that pi's and qi's are all odd a is odd so this is odd this is odd this is odd so this is odd this whole term is odd and a is odd so the left hand side is odd even in the right hand side q1 q2 q3 are all odd this immediately gives us that c is odd, must be odd so so c must be odd now if you remember we had made an observation at the beginning of the solution that at least one of b and c must be even but assuming that all of the roots having assumed that all of the roots of the polynomial p are rational numbers we arrived at the conclusion that b must be odd and c must be odd both b and c must be odd this is the contradiction so we arrive at a contradiction from having made the assumption that all of the three roots of the poly of the cubic polynomial p are rational numbers so it must so it can't be that all of the roots are rational numbers and we are done that is the solution so we are done with the second question as well now we look at the third question here we get we are given another polynomial f of x and we are given some conditions on the two on two coefficients of f of x a1 and a2 and we have to show that not all roots of f of x can be real whenever we have these conditions like not all roots can be real not all roots it's a good idea to try a proof by contradiction and just like in the previous question this question will need vietas formula too so it's a good idea to um know vietas formula okay so p3 we look at p3 now yeah so we are given the polynomial f of x which is i'm sorry x to the power n uh, okay we're given the polynomial f of x which is x power n plus a1 x power n minus 1 plus a2 x power n minus 2 all the way till a n right and we are given the condition and we are given the condition that a1 squared 
is strictly less than a2 we are asked to prove that not all roots of f can be real so we assume for the sake of contradiction that all roots of f of x are real say the roots of f of x are alpha 1 alpha 2 all the way till alpha n let these be the roots of or i should specify the real roots of f of x now f of x is the n degree polynomial so these are all the roots that f can have by the fundamental theorem of algebra okay <clears throat> so these are all the real roots of f of x we use vietas formula again so by vietas formulae summation of all the roots as i goes from 1 to n is equal to minus a1 and um okay i'll just write it below and summation the sum of all sum of product of roots taken two at a time that is summation of alpha i alpha j 1 is less than equal to i less than j less than equal to n okay henceforth i will just write it as i less than j because it's implicit that i and j must lie between 1 and n okay so this summation is equal to a2 now given this now we try to square the first equation we try to square the first equation this gives us Um, I will just write it below so that we have more place to write. No, I'll write it here only. Squaring this gives us a1 squared is equal to summation as i goes from 1 to n alpha i whole squared. And this is equal to summation alpha i squared, the square of the individual terms, i equals 1 to n plus 2 times summation alpha i alpha j as i is strictly less than j this tells us that summation as i goes from 1 to n we just rearrange the terms a little bit alpha i squared this is equal to a1 squared minus 2 summation i less than j alpha i alpha j and this is equal to a1 squared minus 2 and the value of this is a2 we, we have been given the condition i'm sorry if there is a little bit of background noise okay so we have been given the condition that a1 squared is strictly less than a2 we use that inequality and we get this is strictly less than a2 minus 2a2 which is equal to minus a2 now you will notice that this term is strictly non-negative meaning it is greater than or equal to zero so this tells us minus a2 is strictly greater than zero because we have a strict inequality here and this tells us that a2 is negative is strictly negative but this is a contradiction because we already have that a2 is strictly greater than a non-negative term so a2 must be positive but here we have the condition that a2 is strictly negative so that is the contradiction which we come at having assumed having made this assumption that all roots of f are real so we conclude that this assumption can't be true in other words not all roots of f of x can be real and we are done so we are done with the first three questions we we'll look at the fourth question now okay the fourth question gives us a positive integer d and we are asked to prove that there exists a right angle triangle with rational sides and area equal to d 
if and only if there exists an arithmetic progression x square y square z square of squares of rational numbers whose common difference is d now this question actually has two directions we have to prove two directions because of this if and only if so we will look at both directions we first assume that x squared plus um uh, is there enough place here to write i will write it here yeah this is the fourth question we are given a positive integer t first assume we first assume that there exists an arithmetic progression x square y x square y square z square of squares of rational numbers whose common difference is d so suppose there exists an arithmetic pro suppose we have an arithmetic progression x square y square z square of squares of rational numbers that is this is an ap with common difference with common difference d and we are given that x y z are all are all rational numbers so 2d is equal to z squared minus x squared and this gives us okay this is just a note note that so d is equal to half z plus x times z minus x so you will see you will recognize that this term on the right hand side is very similar to the formula for the area of a right angle triangle half base height half into base into height not just a right angle triangle any triangle actually just the base and the height so half base height that gives us the idea of what uh, of how we can construct a right angle triangle so look at this right angle triangle we consider this right angle triangle we take the perpendicular the length of the perpendicular as z plus x and the length of the base as z minus x having done that so this is this is of course a right angle triangle and a right angle triangle like this exists but the question specifies that there exists a right angle triangle with all rational sides all sides must be rational that is something we yet have to prove we have to prove yet and area equal to d so area equal to d is already done from this i'm sorry from uh, from this formula and these two sides the perpendicular and the base are all are already rational numbers so all we are left with is to prove that the hypotenuse is a rational number by the pythagoras theorem the hypotenuse is z plus x whole squared plus z minus x whole squared the square root of this this is equal to 2 times z squared plus x squared if you simplify this now we are given that x uh, x squared plus y squared and z squared is an ap so this tells us that z squared plus x squared over 2 i'm sorry this is equal to 2 y squared we substitute this we substitute this in that in this expression and this gives us that this is equal to 2 times 2 y squared which is equal to 2 y and which is very easily noticeable it's a rational number and we are done the first direction of the question is done they are given uh, given an AP of squares of rational numbers with common difference D there exists we have constructed a right angle triangle with all rational sides and whose area is D now we look at the other direction we will use this direction we will use this uh, direction the proof of this direction to prove the next direction so we will take hint from this solution okay now we assume
I still apologize if there is any background noise. They are my neighbors. I really can't do anything about it. Okay. Now we assume that there exists a right angle triangle. Suppose this is a right angle triangle. We are given a right angle triangle with all rational sides A, B, C, where a, B, C are all rational numbers. <clears throat> and now we have to prove that there exists uh, an AP of squares of rational numbers with common difference D. So what are all the data that we are given here? The first data is that A, B, C are all rational numbers. And we are given that the area of this right angle triangle is equal to D. So D is equal to A, B by 2. Now, we do one thing. C is a rational number, right? So, and uh, C, C can be written as A squared plus B squared, which is a rational number because we are given that it's a rational number. Okay. So, now we construct three rational numbers. We make, we say, we define X equal to A minus b by 2 we take y equal to c by 2 and we take z equal to a plus b by 2 it is very uh, you can see that x y and z are all rational numbers because a b and c are rational numbers and now we look at the ap we look at the ap x squared No, uh, it was wrong of me to already say that this is an AP. We look at the three squares of rational numbers and we will later prove that this is an AP. A plus B by 2 whole square. Now we have to prove that this, uh, we have to prove that this is an AP and that it has a common difference D. Okay. First of all, notice, okay, we just directly calculate. So, c squared by 4, that is uh, c by 2 whole squared, minus a minus b by, a minus b squared by 4, this is equal to c squared minus a squared minus b squared plus 2ab over 4. We already have that c is equal to a square plus b square plus c square or in other words c square is equal to a square plus b square. So c square is equal to a square plus b square. This term will become 0 and this is equal to a b by 2 is equal to d. So the difference of these two rational numbers, the difference between these two rational numbers squares of rational numbers is equal to d. We do the same thing for these two now. a plus b squared by 4 minus c squared by 4. This is equal to a squared plus b squared plus 2ab minus c squared by 4. And again a squared plus b squared minus c squared cancels out. And we are left with a b by 2 which is equal to d again. So the difference between these two <clears throat> squares of rational numbers is again d and we can conclude that this is an ap with common difference d and especially uh, more precisely this is an ap of squares of rational numbers squares of rational numbers and we are done with the proof of the fourth question as well. We'll put a QED symbol. Okay. Having done that, we move to question number five, which is a geometric question. <clears throat> the fifth question gives us a square ABCD 
new setting where ABCD and A and B are set to be on the positive x axis and the positive y axis respectively. We are given the coordinates of C which lies in the first quadrant and we are asked to determine the area of ABCD in terms of U and V. terms of u and v this actually has a very short very nice and short solution we can come here uh, again sorry if there is a lot of shouting noise i really have nothing to do about this it was a noisy Okay, we move to P5. We draw the diagram and a good diagram is necessary and it is tough to draw a good diagram on a pen tab. These are the, we can draw a better straight line. This is the positive X axis. This is the X axis the y-axis <clears throat> and we are given a square on this plane, the first quadrant. Please bear with me till I, while I draw my diagram. Okay. good enough easy to understand so this is a this is b this is c and this is d and we are given that the coordinates of c are u and v we have to find the area of <coughs> a b c d in terms of in terms of u and v we assume that this angle is theta that is okay we call this the origin o so we assume that o a b this angle is equal to theta okay yeah and we assume another thing that the length of the the side length of the square a b or a, a b b c c d d a this is equal to a these are all assumptions, okay? This is A. So, since this is A, you will notice, I will mainly be working on the diagram and I will do some calculations on the right hand side. It will be easier to understand. Since this is, since AB is equal to A, we get the length of side OA to be equal to A cos theta and we get the length of side OB. We get this length as A sin theta. We get OB equal to A sin theta. Again, since angle OAB is theta, angle OBA will be 90 degree minus theta since this is 90 degrees this will be theta again now we look at um, i will extend this axis a little bit for a better diagram this is y and we draw a dotted line here we drop a perpendicular from c there is no need for a dotted line we just drop a perpendicular from C onto the y axis at M. Okay. So angle M B C is equal to theta and B C is equal to A. Again, M B is A cos theta. M B is A cos theta. That gives us that OB that okay 
uh, OB is equal to A sine theta and VM is equal to A cos theta. So OM is equal to A sine theta plus A cos theta and uh, we drop a perpendicular from C onto the x axis as well. We call this point say N. We call this point N. Now look at the coordinates of the point C. It's UV. Since this is a perpendicular line, ON will be equal to U. And that is ON is equal to U. And this is just a rectangle here. O N C M is just a rectangle. So O N is equal to U is equal to C M. And M O is equal to C N. So C N, which is actually equal to V, is equal to O M. Okay. So we will write another side length here. Cm is equal to a sine theta. This is equal to a sine theta. So now we have the data. We can now ignore the diagram. We can look at our data only. That is, for now we have u is equal to a sine theta and v is equal to a sin theta plus a cos theta we substitute a sin theta equals u in this second equation to get v minus u is equal to a cos theta now we square and add this equation and this equation which will give us v minus u whole squared plus u squared is equal to a squared cos squared theta plus sine squared theta and as we all know cos squared theta plus sine squared theta is equal to 1 that gives us a squared so a squared is equal to v minus u squared plus u squared now we have a squared in terms of v and u and what is a square? Remember, a is the side length of the square. So a square is the area of a, b, c, d. A is the side length of the square a, b, c, d. So a square is the area of the square. And we have the area of the square in terms of v and u. And we are done. That is what the question had asked us to do. So we are done with the fifth question as well and this P5, P5 has a very nice small solution. Now we look at P6. Okay. P6 is also a geometry question or a trigonometry question. For solving this question, a tool you will need is the sine rule, uh, which I will um, which I will recall when I uh, write down the solution. Okay, we are given that we have a triangle with A, B, and C being the sides of the triangle, and capital A, capital B, capital C being the B, the angles opposite to the sides. Like capital A is the angle opposite. I'll just write it down. Yeah, hold on. So we have a triangle. We are not given specifically what kind of a triangle it is, but the question asks us to prove that this triangle is isosceles. So, say this side is A, <clears throat> this side length is A, this side length is B, and this side length is C. Then we are said that capital A is this angle, capital B is this angle, and capital C is this angle. And we are given that 
we are given this uh, expression it is sine of a minus b is equal to a over a plus b sine a cos b minus b by a plus b cos a sine b so we are given this data and we are asked to prove that this triangle is isosceles now recall the formula that sine of a minus b is equal to sin a cos b minus cos a sin b and we are given that this is equal to this expression this is equal to this i will remove the highlight because it is making it untidy and i will use these yeah. equations i will just write it down here this is equal to a by a plus b sin a cos b minus b by a plus b cos a sin b okay we rearrange this equation and get that say we bring this a by a plus b sin a cos b to the left hand side and get sin a cos b times 1 minus a by a plus b this is equal to we bring this cos a sin b to the right hand side and get cos a sin b times 1 minus b by a plus b this is equal to no we this equation implies that sin a cos b by b by uh, times b by a plus b is equal to cos a sin b times a by a plus b hmm. okay we can cancel a plus b a plus b from both sides and rearranging this equation a second time we get cos b b by sin b so on the right hand side we keep cos b b and we bring sin b to the denominator uh, this gives us cos a times a by sin a <clears throat> and now by the sine rule i will recall the sine rule the sine rule says that this is another handy tool that you should know this tells us that a by sin a is equal to b by sin b is equal to c by sin c is equal to 2r where r is the circumradius of the triangle <coughs> and small a small b small c capital a capital b capital c are as given in the question so actually b by sin b is equal to a by sin a we can cancel those terms out they are non-zero and that gives us cos b is equal to cos a now a and b are angles of the triangle which means that they lie strictly between 0 and 180 degrees that is a and b lie strictly between 0 and pi and therefore cos b equals cos a implies a is equal to b so these two angles of the triangle are equal this triangle that we had this angle is equal to this angle therefore this triangle is isosceles and we are done therefore triangle abc is isosceles and we are done so we are done with the sixth question also we have only two more questions remaining both of them are from calculus 
we look at the seventh question first. Okay. We look at P7. So, P7 gives us a differentiable function f such that f of f of x is equal to x for x belonging to the uh, closed interval 0, 1. And we are given that f of 0 is equal to 1. So, we have to determine the value of this integral. Of this integral. I'll write down the data here for convenience. We are given f is a differentiable function. We'll write differentiable as diffable. Is differentiable function and f of f of x is equal to x for what's happening to my pen for x belonging to the closed interval 0 comma 1 and we are given that f of 0 is equal to 1 right yeah so we are asked to find the value of the integral integration from 0 to 1 integration from 0 to 1 x minus fx to the power 2016 dx we call this integral i the value of this definite integral equal to i by the end of the solution you will notice you will understand that this value 2016 actually makes no sense it can be any even number and this and the value of the integral or the process that we use to find it will be the same it can be any even number you will see that by the end of the end of the solution now we use the substitution theorem we use substitution here first of all we make a small observation we are given that f of 0 is equal to 1 so putting x equal to 0 in this equation gives us this gives us f of f of 0 is equal to 0 which implies f of 1 is equal to 0 so these are two data that we will need in this solution Now we look at this integral. I will bring this integral down. Come here. This integral is <clears throat> equal to now zero is f of one and one is f of zero equal to x minus f of x to the power 2016 d of x now since uh, f is differentiable x minus fx is also differentiable this gives uh, by the substitution theorem this is equal to integral from 1 to 0 x minus fx Hold to the power 2016 f dash x dx. Now we interchange the limits of the integral to get this is equal to uh, I'm sorry negative 0 to 1 x minus fx hold to the power 2016 f dash x dx <clears throat> right okay so i is equal to this so 2i will be equal to integral from 0 to 1 x minus fx all to the power 2016 dx minus integration from 0 to 1 
x minus fx whole to the power 2016 f dash x dx right now we can zoom in and zoom in a little bit that's okay this is equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of x minus f of x whole to the power 2016 times 1 minus f dashed x it doesn't really matter okay okay so this is 2i now we again use substitution here because you can just take u equals x minus f of x to get to get du um i will not do this you can substitute u equals x minus f of x to get this is equal to i will write the substitution later on that will mess up my solution okay so this is equal to notice what is zero zero is right so no it was okay we substitute we substitute u equal to x minus f of x to get that this integral is equal to integration from since u is equal to x minus f of x this gives us this integral is from 0 minus f of 0 to 1 minus f of 1. We put in the value 1 into this function u to get this is equal to u to the power 2016 du. This is just a simple integral now. So what is 0 minus f of 0? f of 0 is 1. This is equal to minus 1 and this is equal to 1. u to the power 2016 du which is u to the power 2017 over 17 calculated and the with the limits minus 1 to 1 this value is equal to 1 by 2017 minus of minus 1 by 2017 which is equal to 2 by 2017 so 2i is equal to 2 by 2017. So i is equal to 1 by 2017. And this is our final answer. Now, as I was saying, for any even number, you can do this. You can do this entire process because if you notice, we haven't really used that this number 2016 in this solution anywhere. Okay, so if we replace 2016 by 2n, our final answer will simply become, our final answer will simply become i equals 1 over 2n plus 1, if I'm not wrong. Um, 2n plus 1, 2n plus 1, yes. Our final answer will just become 1 by 2n plus 1 if we replace 2016 by any other even number. Okay. But that's not required in this question. That was just a digression. Okay. So we are done with the seventh question also. Now we are on to the last question. So we are ending this. We, we are nearing the end of this discussion. And for the end, for the eighth question, we are given a sequence of real numbers. Uh, and we are given the recursive definition. An plus 1 is given to be 3an by 2 plus an. Uh, okay so p8 is we are given a sequence a n the sequence of real numbers a n and a n plus 1 is given to be 
3 n uh, I'd like to zoom in a little bit I already write this this is looking very big okay p8 we are given a sequence a n of real numbers defined as a n plus 1 is defined as 3 a n over 2 plus a n for all n greater than or equal to 1 this is how a n uh, the sequence a n is defined for the first sub part we are given that a1 lies strictly between 0 and 1 so this is the first sub part the first sub part a1 is greater than 0 and less than 1 and we are asked to prove that an is we are given actually we are given the hints we are asked to prove that an is increasing the sequence an is increasing and that the limit of the sequence as n tends to infinity is equal to 1. Sequence converges to 1. For this solution, I should have mentioned, for this solution, we will be needing another theorem that is known as the monotone convergence theorem, which I will uh, which I will recall uh, in the solution below. Okay. We are given that a1 lies strictly between 0 and 1. That is a base case. We will try to prove inductively that actually all of the terms of the sequence are lying strictly between 0 and 1. So base case is already given to us. We assume that assume that a n is strictly less than 1 greater than 0 for some natural number. Uh, instead of using n, let's use some other natural number, k. For some positive integer, k. That gives us a k plus 1 is defined in terms of a k as 3 a k by 2 plus a k. Since a k is non-zero, this is equal to 3 by 2 plus a k plus 1. Now, a k is less than 1. This implies 1 plus 2 by a k is greater than 3. And this implies 3 by 2 by a k plus 1 is less than 1. So, a k plus 1 is also less than 1 <clears throat> and it is trivial to see that a k plus 1 is actually strictly greater than 0 because we are just using this definition is using 3 2 and a k a k is strictly positive and all of the other terms are strictly positive so the a k plus 1 it's apparent from this definition because of definition that a k plus 1 is strictly greater than 0 and we have proven that it is strictly less than 1. So, by the principle of mathematical induction, by principle of mathematical induction, a n is less than 1 greater than 0 for all natural numbers, for all positive integers. Now, given that, we will now show that the sequence, using this, we will now show that the sequence a n is strictly increasing. That is what we want to prove. Yes. Okay, we recall the recursive definition once again. A n plus 1 is given to be 3 n by 2 plus A n for all natural numbers. This tells us that A n plus 1 by A n, we can do this because A n is non-zero. This is equal to 3 by 2 plus A n. Now, A n is strictly less than 1. So, this is greater than 3 by 2 plus 1, which is equal to 1. So, a n plus 1 by a n is greater than 1. This gives us a n plus 1 is strictly greater than a n for all natural numbers. For all positive, I should say positive integers. So, this tells us that the sequence a n is 
strictly increasing. So the sequence a n is strictly increasing. We write down these observations is strictly increasing and we are also given bounds on an we are given that an is strictly greater than 0 and less than 1 for all positive integers since an is strictly increasing and bounded above by 1 monotone convergence theorem Monotone convergence theorem uh, gives us that the sequence is convergent. That is, the limit as n tends to infinity of a n is equal to a real number. That is, this real number exists. The limit exists, a n is convergent. So, this is what a monotone convergence theorem says. Um, for the viewer, I will mention monotone convergence theorem once. Monotone convergence theorem says so if a n is a sequence that is a sequence of real numbers that is strictly increasing, strictly increasing and bounded above, strictly increasing and bounded above, then an is convergent. By by saying that an is convergent, we mean that limit an exists as an as n tends to infinity. It is the same for a sequence that is strictly decreasing. If an is given to be strictly de decreasing, and we are given that an is bounded below this then again an is convergent this will imply that an is convergent so this is the, the uh, theorem that we are using in this solution so limit n tends to infinity an equals a is a real number we will use this in the recursive definition of the sequence a n we were given that n a n plus 1 equals 3 a n by 2 plus a n so taking limit n tends to infinity on both sides remember that we are able to do this because the sequence a n is convergent so it is necessary to prove that the sequence is convergent first and then using this so limit n tends to infinity 3 an by 2 plus an this gives us a is equal to 3 a by 2 plus a so a squared minus a is equal to 0 or a times a minus 1 is equal to 0 this tells us that a is equal to 0 or a is equal to 1. Now note that the sequence is we have proven that a n is strictly increasing. So a n is greater than 1. Um, I'm sorry, is greater than a 1 is strictly greater than 0. a n is greater strictly greater than a 1 for all positive integers strictly greater than 1. So a 1 is less than equal to limit a n as n tends to infinity. Uh, when we take limit n tends to infinity the inequality weakens and this is strictly greater than 0. So a is strictly greater than 0. So a can't be equal to 0 therefore a is equal to 1. In other words, 
limit n tends to infinity a n is equal to 1. We have proven it. The next part of the solution uses the exact similar argument. We'll look at the next part now. We are now we are given that a1 is strictly greater than 1. So we have to prove that a n is decreasing. The sequence a n is decreasing and still a n converges to 1. We will use the second part of the monotone convergence theorem in this part. Okay. So we are given here that a1 is strictly greater than 1. This is the base case. We will again prove by induction that all of the terms of the sequence are strictly greater than 1. So this is a base case. And we have uh, our induction hypothesis that we assume that a n is strictly greater than 1 for all positive integers n. Now a n plus 1, uh, 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 what am I writing? I'm sorry. Assume a k is strictly greater than 1 for some positive in k, for some positive integer k. What I had written previously was what we actually have to prove. So now a k plus 1 is equal to 3 a k over 2 plus a k and a k is given, uh, okay, this is equal to 3 by 2 by a k plus 1. Now a k is given to be strictly greater than 1. So this using the same inequality argument as in the first sub part, we get that this is strictly greater than 1. So by the principle of mathematical induction, a n is strictly greater than 1 for all positive integers n. Right? Okay. Now we will use this fact to prove that the sequence is strictly decreasing. Okay. Now I will scroll up. Now a n plus 1 is equal to 3 n by 2 plus a n. This gives us a n plus 1 by a n is equal to 3 by 2 plus a n. Right? Now a n is given to be strictly greater than 1. So this is less than 3 by 2 plus 1 because a n is greater than 1. This is equal to 1. So a n plus 1 is strictly less than a n for all positive integers n. So a n is strictly decreasing is strictly decreasing and moreover we have already seen that the sequence a n is bounded below bounded below by 1 again so again by the monotone convergence theorem, monotone convergence theorem, we can say that a n is convergent, that is limit n tends to infinity a n is equal to a which is a real number, this, this happens, okay. So now we again pass to the limit in the recursive definition of the sequence a n, that is we have a n plus 1 equals 3 a n over 2 plus a n taking limit n tends to infinity on both sides gives us limit n tends to infinity a n plus 1 equals limit okay limit n tends to infinity 3 a n over 2 plus a n oh, okay but we are just nearing the end of the video, so okay. Okay, uh, a reminder, you are able to uh, take limits on both sides because we have already proven that the sequence a n is convergent. You, you could, um, 
if you had not proven that limit uh, a n exists then you would not have been able to take limit on both sides so that would be illegal so this gives us a is equal to 3 a over 2 plus a again a times a minus 1 is equal to 0 so either a is equal to 0 or a is equal to 1 okay now it is very easily seen that how do i show that the sequence a n is equal to uh converges to one and not zero you will see that this is zero this is one the sequence a n approach in this direction go to one they decrease to one and they are bounded below by one right okay a n is a decreasing sequence so if you take an, a, any real number here say r if you take any real number in this open interval 0 comma 1 all terms of the sequence a n are strictly greater than 1 which is strictly greater than r so limit n tends to infinity a n is greater than equal to 1 which is strictly greater than r and which is strictly greater than 0 so a is strictly greater than 0 yeah. so limit of the sequence can't be equal to 0 yeah here therefore we conclude that a has to be equal to 1 in other words limit n tends to infinity a n is equal to 1 this is what the question wanted us to prove and we are done so finally we are done with all of the eight questions from the ugb paper of the isi entrance that was taken in 2016 okay so happy problem solving of more and more problems i will end the video now thank you